Good morning and welcome. On behalf of Micronutrients, welcome to our pre-conference symposium this morning. I would like to thank Bob and the rest of the Western Dairy Management Conference Organizing Committee for allowing us to have this pre-conference symposium this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, micronutrients, we are the manufacturers of IntelliBond trace minerals. Two things to remember is trace minerals with low rumen solubility and high bioavailability. We also invest, ladies and gentlemen, very heavily in research. We believe that our products need to be sold and marketed and used based on good, sound science. And that's one of the reasons we are holding this conference this morning, is to talk about good science and how you make decisions based on the many technologies that are coming down the road. So it's our pleasure this morning to have as our speaker Dr. Tom Overton. Many of you know Tom, have heard him on the lecture circuit throughout the world, throughout the dairy industry. He's in the Department of Animal Science at Cornell University. He's professor of dairy management. He received his BS degree from Cornell and his MS and PhD at the University of Illinois. Uh, the one thing that I always comment about Tom that he never fails to remind me of, he's a diehard New England Patriots fan. <laughs> I'm a Colts season ticket holder. So he never fails to kick sand in my face the couple of times a year that I see each other. So it is with great pleasure this morning, Tom, that we have you here. Please welcome Dr. Tom Overton. Yeah, I don't kick sand in Brian's face. I just hope they get lucky one of these years in Indianapolis. Ooh, all right. Um, hey, want to thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Yeah, not bad. All right. So I want to thank uh, Micronutrients for the kind invitation, Brian and JJ, um, for also giving me a topic this morning that I, I would say stretches uh, my boundaries a little bit in terms of thinking about some of these topics and having to actually spend a little time putting something together. So, so we're going to talk about... Uh, about decision making this morning, right? Um, you know, and making making uh, decisions about or choice about new technologies on the dairy. Okay, and, and of course, the other thing with a title like this is a nice broad one, right? So I can take this a variety of different ways, and we'll see how it goes. So one of the things I think we need to keep in mind, right, is is day in day out, right? Whether you're a, a producer, um, a nutritionist, a veterinarian, uh, somebody else working in the allied industry, you know, we all have a, a huge number of decisions, right, that we potentially could make, right and sometimes do make. And, you know, and, and obviously some of those decisions are more complex than others, um, but I think at the end of the day, we certainly have lots of, lots of things that we can think about from a standpoint of implementation, things we can think about from the standpoint of decision making on the farm, okay? And these range, of course, from, from large capital investments, uh, and here I've got some, uh, some robotic milking systems over here. I got a rotary, I got a parallel parlor here, and, you know, so again, you know, decisions that relate to, um, you know, fundamental differences perhaps in some ways relative to how you're going to go about managing the dairy, okay, to modest capital investments, right? So here's just an example, some of the, uh, some of the activity or rumination monitoring technologies that are now available. Uh, you got things like long day lighting, things that relate to that, you know, heat abatement, okay, so things that obviously are more modest in, in capital investment, but, but anyways, still want to uh, yield a return on that investment. Okay, in some way, shape, or form, you know, to manage your practices, right? And, and we, I could have a huge list here in terms of the things that we might think about, but obviously things like milking frequency, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, I'll give an example here in a little bit, again, you know, 2x versus 3x versus 4x, you know, maybe we think about increased milking frequency in early lactation, right? You know, maybe we think about dry period length, where we do short, do we shorten them to 40 days dry? Do we, do we go continuous lactation? Of course, there's been work in, in some of these areas over time. You know, calf management, so again, colostrum management, early life feeding strategy. So again, and the list could go on and on here relative to management practices. You know, and, and finally, ranging to things like uh, uh, things that relate more to nutritional management, right, which gets me a little closer to areas that I spend more time thinking about. And, you know, from a dry and transition cow program standpoint, do we look at controlled energy diets for all or part of the dry period? You know, how do we approach the, the issue of managing hepacalcemia on the farm? You know, what do we do relative to protein and amino acids and things like that? And those are just examples. We could go on and on as well. You know, do we think about strategic supplementation of specific nutrients in the transition period, right? There's, there's uh, several of those that we could think about there, and you see a couple examples there. And then uh, also, you know, using improved forms of nutrients, right? So again, and that's where, you know, things like uh, hydroxy trace minerals and other, other uh, improved forms of trace minerals fit relative to things like sulfates or oxides maybe in the, in the old days, okay? 
So again, a variety of things that, that we need to think about here, okay, or could think about here relative to, to what we might implement. So the question is, how does one sort through this whole uh, decision-making process, right? I'm just going to give you a few thoughts here. There's other resources out there that kind of do that. Um, I'm going to give you just, you know, some of the ways that I tend to think about this stuff, okay? So one of the ways we can think about it is, you know, what's the reward risk, right? And how are we used to saying that? Do we always say that reward, reward risk? We always say what? Risk reward because we're always focused first on what? Or at least maybe inherent psychologically, right? Maybe we're focused on the downside of something, right? So I switched that around on purpose. Actually, I couldn't, I can't find a lot of that out there. But I switched that around relative to what's. And my apologies if anybody in the room has uh, that I'm simply uh, ripping these concepts off of anybody who's talked about these things before. Okay, apologies. I hear lots of things, and and I'm not going to take any originality here. But I did flip it around relative to again, perhaps thinking about this more from a reward risk standpoint than anything else. Of course, Dave Galligan, I'm going to give him credit for this. Dave's at the University of Pennsylvania, um, was the first one many years ago who started talking about, you know, the use of some of the st statistical principles relative to type 1 and type 2 error uh, in decision making. And, and type 1 error, again, that's the one when, uh, when we're all looking for a P less than 0.05 or 0 0.10 or whatever in, in our stats analysis and things like that. And, and the, the definition of that, of course, is rejecting the null hypothesis when it's true. My translation of this into, uh, into our discussion today is, is making a decision, implement something, and having it not work out, right? So in other words, we, we implement something, whether it's a management practice, whether it's a modification, uh, nutritionally or otherwise, and, and you know, have it basically losing money you know, as a result of that, or having it not meet the expectations we were looking to have, okay? I think the bigger one, and we'll get into this uh, obviously more, is, is the type two error. And again, you know, it would be accepting the null hypothesis when it's false. And, and so the translation of that would be failing to implement something that you should have implemented, right? And I think there are a lot of times we're guilty uh, probably of making type two errors more than anything else in lots of things that we do, right? So again, that's just my, my opinion here, okay? So the question comes into what's the bigger risk, right? Type one versus type two, and, and kind of my general answer, right, is it, is it probably depends on the size of investment or magnitude of, of commitment, right? So if I'm gonna put a, a new barn in, right, or I'm gonna, put a, I'm gonna make a decision to change my, um, change my approach on a milking system standpoint or otherwise, right, boy, that's something that would probably better work out, right, or else the business could be at risk and things like that from a bigger picture standpoint, or I, I acquire a whole bunch of land. I mean, we could do on, on and on and on relative to the decision-making process there, okay? And, you know, but a lot of the things we're looking at, so, so in those cases, you know, maybe the type one uh, risk is, is larger, okay? I think in a lot of the things that we think about, as long as we have a, an approach and a strategy that kind of gets us there, um, you know, our risk of type one error is probably lower than, than the type two. Okay, than, the, than maybe the failure to adopt and things like that. And, and so again, I think it comes back to size of investment or magnitude of commitment and things like that. Okay. So, so what is that potential uh, return on investment, the ROI, how you monitor that? Um, you know, uh, I, am, I am not an economist. There are others in the room who are, are, are economists, right? So my apologies in advance. But, you know, simple partial budgets and things like that where we think about, you know, potential changes in revenue or other benefits. Okay, you know, maybe that, you know, maybe it's a cash revenue benefit, maybe it's reduced labor, right? If we have a meta technology or, or whatever, maybe we have reduced labor, okay? You know, how hard or soft are those numbers, okay? In other words, how confident are we that we're going to see that, uh, that return, okay, from an economic standpoint, if it's a return on, you know, production or decreased cow loss or, or health or repro or whatever, um, you know, and, or labor, right? You know, how, you know, what is the sensitivity of ROI to those changes, right? So how sensitive, you know, again, let's say that response varies, um, you know, how sensitive is that return on investment to that, okay? And, you know, also along with that is how are we going to monitor that, right? So what are we going to try to put into place on the, on the dairy, um, you know, relative to how we're going to monitor that? Again, again, you put in, a, say, a robotic milking system, right? Well, labor had better decrease. Right? I mean, in some way, shape, or form. Now, obviously, that labor that you do have is probably doing different things, right? Um, you're not going to move totally away from labor, but if that's one of the assumptions that you're making, right, how are you going to monitor that to make sure, indeed, that, that that does happen, okay? 
And then also changes in investment, right? So changes in investment or, or expense or cost or whatever, you know, again, whether that's, whether that's uh, labor, whether that's management time, uh, again, whether it's an investment relative to, to the nutritional program on the dairy, you know, what are those assumptions? Okay, how soft or, or hard are the numbers? Those numbers, again, if we're thinking about uh, you know making dietary changes and things like that, those those sorts those numbers are usually harder, right? We kind of know how many cents per cow a day we're looking at, or you know, or whatever in that in that whole equation. Okay, and then also again, you ask the question relative to what's the sensitivity um, of that return on investment to that level of, to that to that investment. Okay, so what's the sensitivity there? All right, so just some of the things that I think about, let's, we're gonna kind of focus more and pretty much for the rest of the discussion on, on management practices or, or uh, nutritional strategies and changes and things like that. And so some of the things, you know, I think, you know, what do we need to think about when we're thinking about adoption management practices or nutritional strategies and technologies, okay? And you know, again, you gotta remember, you know, I'm obviously a, a university-based researcher, um, you know, and, and obviously one foot also in the industry. You know, but, but still, I think we've got to know something about the biology or, or maybe how it's working, right, or how it's potentially working out there. And, and th of course, this ranges all over the place, right, because these fields are, uh, you know, these fields are, are ongoing and, and research is ongoing in all these areas. Of course, some things are quite well understood, right? We know an awful lot about biology associated with things like milking frequency, uh, associated with BST use and things like that. I mean, we understand that very, that we understand things like that very, very well from a, a biology side. You know, I think the emerging or integrative areas, um, you know, are certainly less well understood, and, and we and others in the room, um, you know, certainly are interested in, in some of these things relative to, to, I'm just giving some examples here, right? I mean, we could go on and on here as well, but things that relate to, say, gut integrity, uh, things that relate to oxidative metabolism, things that relate to immune inflammatory mechanisms, and, and there, are, there are nuances and complexities with all these things that I think are really challenging to, to understand out there, and it's a, it's a world that continues to, to evolve over time. And I think we're gaining, right, but you know, what, what appears to be simple on the surface sometimes may not be simple at the end of the day. And, and again, we, and we always have, a, and I, I do too, we always have an inclination to try to, we want everything kind of simple, right? And sometimes things are inherently not simple, okay? How well will it fit the management system, right? Facilities, management style, people, right? You can't leave people off of this list, right? I mean, it's gotta fit the, the culture, not only of ownership, right, but, the, but the, the culture of those that you have working on the farm or working within the organization. You know, of course, we're gonna, we're gonna, um, we're gonna you know, lean back on, you know, what is that projected return on investment? What are our assumptions? Uh, how good do we feel about those assumptions? Um, what's the sensitivity? again, of, of the overall projections to those assumptions, okay? One thing I wanna bring in here, and again, this com probably comes back to management strategies, and I'll give kind of an example here coming up, is you know, what's that opportunity cost for labor management, right? Is there something, you know, from labor management focus time, is that the best use of time for those folks on that, on that dairy? Because I can do lots of partial budgets with, improve, with increased labor for lots of things, right? And it works out. But again, is that the is that the best is that the biggest bang for the buck? And I think we need to think about that again at the farm level when we're doing some of this stuff. Okay, and then again, I think it's important we manage expectations, right? Okay, you know we don't have silver bullets out there, right? And that that I think again we we I, I think in some ways, and I I definitely understand it, right? We wanna we wanna you know if we're if we implement something from a dietary standpoint or other standpoint. You know, we want to see that response, we want to touch that response, we want to feel that response. And the reality is, lots of things that we're going to do that, that make a lot of sense really at the end of the day, they're, they're not going to slap you in the face relative to a response, okay? And, and again, I, that's a hard one to go after, right? Because it goes back to how do you monitor within the, within the context of, of what is usually a very dynamic ecosystem on that dairy, Right. So, but again, um, I, I think we got to keep in mind that that uh, that we got to support stuff with with sound science, sound application. Um, you know, consistency, building, a, and again, building evidence, um, an evidence database is we'll kind of get into here. You know, relative to um, you know our expectations and things like that. Okay. All right. So one of the things um, you know I think about from a standpoint of research is. And again, I, I don't claim uh, I don't claim to be original here. Although I did Google this, and I didn't find any anybody with any trademarks or circle R's on this statement. Um, so I'll hopefully not get sued or anything like that. Um, 
you know, but, you know, I kind of think about a constellation of evidence, right? And, and so I want, I, I don't want just one kind of piece of evidence, right? I kind of want multiple things that I can kind of connect dots on and things like that and, and give me confidence that the decision that we're making is going in the right direction, okay? So what is that, what's in that for me? Um, you know, again, biology and potential mode of action, we've, we've kind of hit on that already. Um, research and demonstration. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously, and there's multiple layers here, right? And, and there's folks that, that are way more eloquent than I am in outlining um, some of these different things, especially when you get into the large epidemiological literature and things like that in, in different ways. But obviously, you know, from my standpoint, I want to see controlled, peer-reviewed university or research center work that, that not only gives us some indication relative to potential response, but also some indication relative to what's going on from a biological standpoint, if we're thinking again about a, a nutritional innovation or things like that. Um, you know, you know, potentially, you know, we're either replicated, either either replicated pens, say for example, within farm, right, or potentially across dairies, um, you know, that uh, that essentially either studies or demonstrations in certain ways, shapes, and forms. Okay, now again, these all have challenges relative to um, relative to how robust they can be, relative to how they're done, you know, there's, and things like that. But still having some element there um, of some field-based work, I think is, for me anyway, is attractive to go along with um, some of the university-based stuff. And of course, we can get uh, more formal, informal, and get into meta-analytic type approaches and things like that. And I'll show you some examples of that here coming up, okay? You obviously want, uh, want whatever you're gonna do to be practical. Right, we've got to keep that in mind to be pragmatic because we want something to have a, a chance of success in on the dairy. Now, obviously, in the case of nutritional innovation and things like that, you know, again, a lot of times that's the dairy working with a nutritionist, and you make a choice to implement a technology or you know an improved form of nutrient or or whatever. Um, you know, other times relative to management practices, again, does it fit with um, with the culture, uh, the management culture, the people, you know, things like that. Do we have examples where it's worked in other places, right? And again, I, I guess I'm talking not only to the dairy producer crowd, but also to the nutritionist crowd in this too, because you and veterinary crowd, because you're all getting, you know, an experience with multiple clients extension as well, okay? And experience comes into play as well, right? Do we, and you know, a lot of times we're talking about newer technologies, right? Um, you know, we may not have a lot of experience. And, you know, one of the things we're finding anyway, and especially with some of the things that relate to technology, is, you know, the days of, of this is all kind of the kinks kind of got worked out at the university level and then it goes out in the field, right? And it kind of goes, that flows that way. You know, that doesn't really happen anymore, right? Again, technology, the availability of, the accessibility of it at the, at the you know, for the farm level. And I think about some of the electronic monitoring technologies. I was, uh, I was uh, one of the one of the part of 50 or 60 folks stuffing stuffing uh, all those wonderful bags that you guys have uh, uh, yesterday. And again, the th a lot of things in those bags obviously relate to you know, a number of them relate to technology in some way, shape, or form, right? So, and we're learning together in all these things, really, from the standpoint of industry, kind of university, kind of all at the same time. All right, just a couple comments here on controlled work. And again, this is an area where. You know, I spend, I spend a fair amount of my life, right? I mean, the vast majority of research that we do falls in this category, although we do do some things uh, with commercial dairies as well, okay? You know, and, and again, a lot of this kind of focuses on transition cow stuff, right? And just a, just a few things to keep in mind, right? And again, because these things do vary over there and, and, and just kind of kind of watch it, right? So, you know, studies that, uh, that enroll but then remove a lot of cows, right, for, re for reasons that, that may be more subjective than others, right? Just, you know, again, you got to keep an eye on some things there. How well do the controls perform? Okay, I'm going to show you an example of this here in just a minute, but I think that's also something we've got to keep in mind anyway is, is from my standpoint, you know, you know when, it, when we've got really well-performing controls, then I'm really happy because that means if we've got some intervention that, that, we're, that we're adding to that and we get a response, I feel pretty good that we're gonna see that same response applied out in the field, right? Okay, right, versus controls that maybe are compromised a bit. Uh, replication statistical power, right? This is, a, again, a big one, and we gotta keep that in mind, you know, because, you know, do we have enough cows on the study to, to get at biologically significant or economically important differences versus some of the statistical significance. I mean, some of the, some of the studies that were done, you know, 15 years ago or so related to, say, zero-day drive periods, right? Um, you know, very few cows per treatment uh, had, had milk yield numerical differences of, you know, three kilos for, you know, six to eight pounds post-calving. 
but they weren't statistically significant, right? Again, I'm not trying to pick on that work, right? I understand, you know, but again, you gotta keep that all in mind relative to, you know, are we, are we, do we have enough cows on to really get at some of this stuff? And we tend to, we tend to try to put more cows on um, compared to lots of places, okay, per treatment. Uh, our data internally consistent within studies, and you know, again, when we're looking at presentations, right, are, are all or most of the available results being presented in some way, shape, or form, right? Or, or are we just kind of cherry picking um, the good stuff, right? And, and again, I, you know, I've got to be mindful of that as well, right, in terms of stuff that we do. But again, I think it's important to kind of get a sense for, for all that. You know, and again, looking for patterns of response, just because we don't get a response in, in one particular study doesn't, doesn't negate other studies that may show a response, right? It says, okay, we've got some differences here in terms of how these studies are conducted. We probably shouldn't expect something every single time, okay, right? And there's going to be some level of heterogeneity response there. Again, meta-analysis helps to formalize some of that, okay? Just a, a quick example, I think I've sanitized this enough. This is some, some recent work published over the last couple of years in Journal of Dairy Science. It's actually two different studies here. These are both transition cow studies, uh, multiparous cows, showing fairly large responses to, the, the, to some of the things of interest in the studies here. This top study, here's the controls. This is dry matter intakes here from calving. Uh, through 30 days in milk, and so the calving, if you average, look at the average dry matter intake for the first 21 days or so in this study, you know, they were running about 26 pounds for multiparous cows, okay? Now, in the dairy level, those of you fresh cow groups, Holstein, multiparous Holstein, fresh cow groups, how happy are you with 26 pounds of dry matter intake in those pens, right? Not real happy, right? Okay, and then another one here, control group here in, in black. Uh, again, the cows got off to a good start overall, but then you actually see them starting to, to decline in intake. Now again, the responses were large, right? But I'm sitting here looking at these control groups, especially in this study going, what is going on there you know, with those cows, right? So again, be mindful of, of stuff like that, okay? So meta-analysis here, this is some of the work that Todd Duffield done, did uh, a uh, long time, actually, I think I may have the wrong year in there. Sorry, Todd. Um, I think it was probably 2008, my bad, okay? But this is just uh, a meta-analysis of the effect of menensin or rumensin on circulating blood ketones, right? And showing in general, you know, you guys have seen lots of this meta-analysis has become fairly popular in, in, in certainly some of the nutritional worlds here. And again, showing not only the variation among studies, the weighting of studies, the error, but then also typical responses and things like that. So again, nice ways to be able to look at some of that more formally. Okay, just gonna give a very quick example here relative to, to milking frequency. Um, and you know, again, you know, this is one of those things, this topic is not new, right? So, you know, different folks have looked at things, you know, 4X, 2X, about 7% increase in milking capacity and labor required, different schemes out there. You know, I've always looked at this as something that's fairly minimal in its economic investment, right? Because the, 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 the increased investment is basically labor and feed, and the feed investment only comes if the cows respond with more milk, right? So, you know, it's, it's an incremental or marginal milk response there. And again, we'll, we'll always trade that one, okay? Um, this is the one that really got it going. This is Israel, uh, you know, long 20 years ago plus now got basically, you know, five to seven kilos, so that's, uh, you know, 10 to 15 pounds a day with 6X milking versus, or 6X the first uh, six weeks anyway lactation versus uh, 3X, and then when they went back to 3X and things like that, they held the response, okay? Bunch of studies here, again, done over time. Most of these showing uh, nice responses here relative to uh, component, this is a kilo, so component uh, or, or milk yield and also uh, milk component yield. Some of these studies didn't report it. See, one error, one study here, this is Matt Van Bala, is done on a commercial dairy. We're going to spoke about just for a minute. This one actually showed a, a negative response. That would be a type 1 error, right? That'd be a, you know, we implemented it and, and moved backwards, okay? What was interesting in that one study anyway, and just to, and again, this isn't to be uh, a nice study overall. This is actually in the days, but really the, at the first days, we're really starting to think about, you know, time away from groups and, and things like that. You know, and, and Matt characterized those 6X cows, and they were spending, they were a long way from the parlor, and they were out of those pens for six plus hours a day, right? So, you know, I give them a lot of credit for characterizing this really and saying, okay, yeah, that's probably the reason why we didn't get a good response in that study. So back to, again, fitting the system, okay? We've done work, not only control work, but also field-based work where we see responses here with 4X, 2X compared to 2X, okay? 
you know, we can do a partial budget on a bar napkin, right? And we can come up with, uh, you know, three and a half pounds of component corrected milk response. You see the assumptions there. Um, you see some labor, labor and feed assumptions there. And I can come up with about 80 bucks a cow. It looks pretty good, okay? Looks pretty good. Yet we have very little adoption, right? I think part of that is, is one, I think in general our modeling and others would show 3X is probably a better, in almost all scenarios, is probably more economically favorable than whole herd 3X than either 4X, 2X, or 2X, okay? Um, you know, the other part too is, is you wonder, despite the data, does this really fit the systems in a lot of dairies, right? And again, that comes back to the, the stuff that, that is a little harder to get after. Okay. Now, what about opportunity costs? I'm going to do this, try to do this here in a couple minutes. Okay. I'm going to pick on some of my colleagues here. Who did, this is great work they did. Jess McCart, Daryl Nidham, Gary Etzel at Wisconsin, and then Chuck Gard at Cornell. This is an econo economic analysis relative to uh, testing and treating protocols for, for subclinical ketosis or hyperketonemia anyway on farms. Okay. They did. Uh, they looked at uh, different strategies here, given some of the data that they had. Uh, they had had. They had either no testing with all fresh cows, given five days of oral PG, or different testing schemes here, where they would actually go use a use a meter, test test the blood ketones, and then based on those results, treat with glycol. Okay. Okay. Just some of their assumptions here. Again, I think you guys have my presentation on your on the memory sticks that you guys all picked up, so you guys can can look at that. But again, fairly. I think fairly comprehensive and nice, very nice overall modeling here relative to, to those assumptions and things like that, okay? And when they came out with the, the outcomes per 100 fresh cows, right, and most herds would run, you know, if you look at incidence, right, which is usually double or so prevalence, okay, you know, somewhere in the range of 40 to 60% of, of fresh cows, it would be probably an incidence that's not, that's, that's probably reasonable. We'd have some that run under that, some that run over that, okay? You know, and I'm looking at, they're looking at returns here of these different strategies of, you know, 500 to, uh, to 900 bucks, you know, to 1,000 bucks per 100 fresh cows, right? And again, you guys think about some of these strategies, they're pretty intensive to put into play on the farm level or more intensive, right? And I think, again, it begs the question, is that the, is that the best use of our, of our labor and management time? Okay, I'm not arguing that in some dairies it might, might not be a good approach, Okay, but I've always looked at this and I look at these numbers eh, that for me anyway, there's probably other things that we ought to think about doing. There's might maybe other good uses for that labor management time at the herd management level. Okay. All right. Uh, and again, Jess has developed some nice models here relative to herd level prevalence. I am a big fan of, of ketone testing as a, say, a weekly monitor to things like that, okay? Uh, and again, this gets, this gets cross areas here. I don't want everybody to confuse here. I'm a, I'm a big fan of ketone testing as, say, a weekly or, or otherwise herd level monitor. Um, you know, how intensive should we get on a cow basis? I don't really know. Um, but, you know, they worked out some nice schemes here where, you know, again, we want to live in that less than 15% of fresh cows with high blood ketones, and maybe we keep monitoring and things like that, okay? Um, obviously, we don't want to land in the, in, the, in the zone where we got all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, subclinical ketosis on the farm, and so we're better off just drenching every single cow that, that, uh, that, that calves there, right? We really don't want to live in that, in that zone. And I would also argue we probably don't want to live in the zone here where, we, where, where testing and treating becomes really attractive. We want to, we want to kind of, again, live in that and adjust manage as needed to get in that low, low prevalence area, okay? So just to summarize and conclude, I guess maybe we have a minute. I, our moderator is sitting right, we have one minute, perfect. Um, have a process and work to be systematic. Brian, it works for my patriots, all right? Weigh the uh, reward risk, okay? And again, be mindful anyway of, of you know, I think again, you know, you know, these are gonna vary depending on what the decision is. Um, I would say, and I think it can be easy, can be easy to be skeptical, right, in different ways, but I would say try not to let skepticism, fear, or type one error um, get in the way of, of making a decision that likely yields an economic return on the farm. You know, determine the potential return on investment assumption sensitivity, but be realistic. And also be realistic about ability to monitor, right? Again, we, we, we want to monitor. I get it, right? But a lot of the things that, we're, that we think about are, are pretty nuanced in terms of response. We still get economic responses, but uh, they're not going to hit us in the face. Uh, no silver bullets, right? And again, a lot, I think a lot of things that are biological and economic medieval may be difficult to measure. Develop that constellation of evidence. That gives you confidence that that's the right um, decision. 
and, uh, and I would say also be conscious of management and practicality and opportunity cost. And with that, I am done and potentially on time. Thank you. Okay.